Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Dominic King. I'm a sports medicine and interventional orthopedic physician at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, looking forward to talking to you today. Uh, tendinopathies are a, a great passion of mine. Uh, my colleague and uh, my friend, Dr. Jason Jenin, and I have uh, made it our goal uh, in Cleveland to better understand tendinopathies through uh, this classification system that we've developed. Uh, and we're looking forward to discussing this uh, with you today. So let's go ahead and jump on in. If we examine the last 30 years of tendinopathy management, and we break that down by decade, uh, we have what's happened before 1990. This would be everything we saw we called tendinitis. We thought this was clearly an inflammatory problem uh, treated with anti-inflammatory type of treatments. Uh, therapeutic ultrasound came on board. Uh, katsu came into uh, existence and popularity. And of course, we had corticosteroid injections. You know, we called these things tendinitis, itis meant inflammation. So you need to take away that inflammation. You do corticosteroid injections. After we got into the 1990s, uh, Alfredson's heavy load eccentrics uh, came on board. Physical therapy was a great modality to treat these. Uh, some people were put into boots. We were still treating this as if it was inflammation. Uh, extracorporeal shockwave therapy came on board again. And obviously, we, we still did quite a few corticosteroid injections in the 90s. In the 2000s, more research started to come out in the concepts of whether or not this was truly inflammation or there was more degeneration in these tendons uh, came into uh, play. Some researchers out of all, Australia and around the world uh, looked at saying, how much inflammation are we actually treating? Uh, we started treating these with uh, trinitrate uh, patches, uh, glycyl trinitrate. You know, we use these for a ton of Achilles tendinopathies. Uh, they would cut it and wrap it around the back and bring in uh, the uh, nitrous oxide we think might be able to help heal the tendon. There's a degenerative process. We need to repair this tendon. Uh, katsu ended up turning into uh, BFR uh, and blood flow restriction. And maybe there's this signaling pathway that we can activate in the tendon. Uh, but of course, we were still doing corticosteroid injections uh, in these tendons because there was this thought of we have to be able to do something. You have to be able to offer a patient something other than something that may take weeks or months to work. So, so a lot of corticosteroid injections being done. Coming into 2010s, orthobiologics hits the market. We now have this amazing tool that can just regenerate all this tissue and heal everything that's there. Uh, and we quickly found out that that might not actually be the truth in those types of treatments. Uh, Procedures like TenJet come on board where we're going in and debriding out this type of degenerative tissue, and then there's still corticosteroid injections. When you look at that, you could say, you know, we have 30 years of new developments in tendinopathy treatment. Although we may not really know how to use those and when to use those, that underlined by the fact that we really haven't significantly developed how to classify tendons at all. We still consider tendinopathies to be generally inflammatory. We still call them tendinitis. And our lack of really knowing how to approach each one of these with different treatments, we at least feel is directly tied to that lack of classification. And so this is the reason why we have a 45-year-old guy who comes into our office, has atraumatic lateral elbow pain, x-rays look normal, he's got tenderness palpation right at that lateral epicondyle, pain with resisted middle finger extension, He's got no radial collateral ligament instability. He's got no radicular symptoms. It doesn't look like it's a CIN. And when we look at this, we call that tennis elbow. It's a very large term for something that seems like it should be a little bit more specific. And what we mean by that is, is that inflammation? Is it degeneration? Is there partial tearing? Is there fascial scarring around that area? Uh, has this guy gotten six or seven corticosteroid injections, and that may have had a significant effect on that. We haven't really looked in depth at understanding that uh, better. We haven't tried to classify that tendon. We just call it tennis elbow when we throw some different treatments at it. And the problem is, especially when it comes to orthobiologics, if you look at the research, almost every study that shows some type of treatment, whether it's injection-based treatment or a mechanical-based treatment, physical therapy, or orthobiologic, the inclusion criteria for those patients are greater than three months of lateral elbow pain, not responsive to the conservative treatment. And this is shown in level one studies. So this is still considered to be a reliable inclusion criteria. But if you actually look at the tendon in the layer by layer parts of tissue, 
we would look at that and say that that's like treating apples to oranges. If I'm treating an inflammatory tendinopathy versus degenerative tendinopathy, I would expect those tendons to respond differently to the exact same treatment. But we've never demonstrated that. We haven't demonstrated it in research, and we don't have a classification method to approach these tendons. And that's what led to us wanting to understand tendons better and using a different imaging modality than MRI. So we've gone from calling everything on the outside of the elbow, lateral elbow pain or tennis elbow, and being a little bit more specific than just the term chronic tendonitis, we want to try to be as specific as possible with the tissue because we do feel that will help us understand our treatments better, or put it, to put it another way, in order to understand our treatments, we have to understand the tissue we're treating to begin with. So we began doing this with musculoskeletal ultrasound. Very quickly, we knew that we could identify several features. So let's talk about the common extensor tendon. Here's the lateral left condyle and the radial head. This outlines the common extensor tendon at the top. Everything above these arrows would be the fascial plane and the layer of fascia on top of it. Uh, you have your radial collateral uh, ligament that comes across here, splits right on the top there. This is the radio capitellar joint that's here. Uh, and then everything inside here is the common extensor tendon. We can see the individual fibers and look at this nice fibular pattern. So this would be a normal looking common extensor tendon. Using power Doppler, we can show the uh, inflammation. This is noted as hyperemia, so neovascularization, new blood flow that is within this tendon. We can see areas of hypoechogenicity. This is that mucinous kind of mu mucousy type of softer tissue that we look at as a degenerative tendinopathy. This is what we call tendinosis. And then we can see a mix between those. So I would look at that and say, if each one of these have pain, each one of them may have different reasons of having pain, and those are all going to respond differently to different treatments. So this understanding allowed us to construct a classification system uh, around these concepts. And we were asked, can we reliably identify these findings? So we took a look, we took uh, six readers, uh, two musculoskeletal radiologists, uh, myself and Dr. Jenin, who are the fellowship trained physicians, and then two novice uh, sports medicine fellows uh, who are brand new to reading. Uh, we all looked at 50 of the common extensor tendon uh, cine loop evaluations, had two separate reading dates and randomized the orders on it. And we looked at seven different features and graded them as negative, meaning there was none or minimal. So a, a very uh, qualitative type of evaluation or positive, meaning we looked at it and it looked like it was more than minimal. There, there was a significant character uh, in that finding. Uh, so we looked at hypoecogenicity, hyperemia, tearing, uh, and thesophytes, fascial thickening and scarring, tendon thickening and intratendon calcification. So our inter and intra-rater reliability across the board, just to get to the meat and potatoes, what we found was we were really good at being able to identify tendinosis, that, that hypoecogenic area, and looking at hyperemia. You can see neovascularization very easily. Uh, both of those were highly reliable and accurate. Um, the rest of the features really didn't seem to exhibit that same level of reliability. Um, and uh, again, a lot of it is very qualitative, but we wanted to come away with a understanding of what was easy to be able to see because anything would be better than just pushing on the outside of the elbow and saying this hurts so it's tennis elbow. Uh, this seemed to be the first study that we could find to evaluate all of these. We, we have submitted this for publication. Uh, an interesting takeaway was there was consistent agreement uh, in reliability across all readers. So even if you were a seasoned uh, musculoskeletal radiologist or a novice sports medicine fellow, he still could come away with this as being able to identify hypoecogenicity and hyperemia. So with those findings, we came up with this model of trying to get a better, better character of what's going on uh, with the tendon. So what does the intratendinous content look like? If you took a look at an ultrasound, what are your thoughts about in 3D space what that tendon actually looks like? Because the variability, as we felt in the symptoms, was likely related to the variability of the content. So looking at those images again that we showed you a second ago, if you just took a cross section of it, turned it on end and took a look at it, let's just say from a cartoon standpoint, this looks like a normal tendon. You have a lot of these type one type of collagen fibers all stacked nicely. This is dense regular connective tissue. Hyperemia would then be more of an inflammatory tendon content. So you'd still have plenty of good fibers that are there, but then it's interposed with this 
neovascular type of tissue, maybe increased vascular endothelial growth factor in response to stress, linear stresses on the tendon cause this to occur. Uh, on the opposite side of that, uh, the lack of inflammation, but the presence of these degenerative type of features, again, plenty of good fibers all around those tendons, uh, around this tendinosis, but clearly identifiable areas where there is this mucinous type three, type four type of collagen. And then of course, if you could have each one of those, you could have a mix uh, between the two. Interestingly enough, you never see hyperemia in the areas of tendinosis. So that, that truly is a degenerative feature and an acute feature. So putting this into a classification, this is what we have come up with. Uh, GK1 or Jenin King is our uh, classification. Type one would be a normal tendon. There's no tendinosis, there is no hyperemia. And when we mean negative, we mean there is not a significant feature that allows us to say that the character of this tendon is either degenerative or inflammatory. A type two is overwhelmingly inflammatory. There's not really a lot of tendinosis. There's not a degenerative feature. This is kind of what you would think of as tendinitis uh, when somebody comes in with a big swollen lateral elbow uh, that just looks angry. It, it feels warm. It, it has that sense of inflammation. Type three would be degenerative. So this is the more chronic type of pain. Patients or somebody holds their arm in a certain position for a long time. They're on the phone for a while and then they go to stretch their elbow out. They feel that tight kind of restricted motion in their elbow. That, that seems to be more uh, tendinosis and degenerative. And that's what the imaging looks at, not having any hyperemia. So positive tendinosis, negative hyperemia. And then, of course, a four then would be a mix of that and inflammatory on degenerative. They've noticed for years that they've had tightness and pain. Uh, maybe they golf. And at the start of the season, they find they feel good, but uh, as they get into the season and they're golfing more 18 uh, hole rounds, uh, by the end of the rounds, they get a, a large inflammatory pain. They ice it a lot. It's okay the next day, and then it just kind of goes through the same cycle. This is what our classification is based on, uh, and it's helpful for us because a tendon that doesn't really have many of these features, uh, this just may be not even an acute strain. They just might might need uh, some supportive mechanisms to their shoulders, their back, some of their mechanics. If they're acutely inflamed, we can treat this with different anti-inflammatory type of approaches and different therapy approaches. And then for the type three and their type four, the degenerative features alone, uh, we can approach with hands-on manual therapy, instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization, those types of things, counterforce bracing. Uh, but we also now have this option of minimally invasive tenotomy, where we can go in and debreed out that degenerative type of tissue while leaving those good type 1 fibers in place as a different means to provide a more permanent solution for uh, those patients. Uh, and so the, that, that seems to be for us what that role for MIP. So this is kind of the maybe a longer way to describe why do we use minimally invasive tenotomy? Well, in the way we approach tendons and how we view them, minimally invasive tenotomy serves the role to debreed that degenerative mucinous type of material, improving the overall character of that tendon, and then also improving that intratendinous forces. Uh, so that is uh, our presentation on the tendinopathy classification that we've uh, developed and the reason why we may choose or not choose minimally invasive tenotomy for patients with uh, lateral elbow pain. Uh, in other webinars, we'll be discussing pearls related to how we perform the minimally invasive tenotomy procedure as well as appropriate post-procedure rehabilitation guidelines. So please take a look for those. Uh, and we welcome your feedback regarding all of these presentations. And we look forward to answering any questions that you may have in the future. Thank you very much for your time.